Yes, I just wanted to start by saying that um, when I joined Gladstone 21 years ago, I in no way imagined that I would stand here in front of you as the next director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology. Um, I'm actually only filling part of Warner's shoes. Um, I'm only taking the virology part. We had to actually divide his legacy into two institutes, um, and the other part is led by Alex Marson uh, and is devoted to genomic immunology. When I joined uh, 21 years ago, I came from Heidelberg, um, where I had started my first lab in the Cancer Research Center on HIV. Um, and Heidelberg is usually a very sunny place, um, but sometimes it also has cosmic rivers, um, especially when Warner visits, because we had the most cosmic river that ever happened in Heidelberg, and the whole city flooded um, while he was visiting, and he had his um, hotel very much right behind here, this, this uh, entrance into the old city. Um, so I remember very vividly how Warner and I escaped in the early mornings over the, by foot, over the old castle bridge here, over the old bridge, uh, on the other side of the flooded Necker River to bring Warner back to the airport. Um, and he was so relieved when he was back at the airport. <laughs> anyway, so um, I came to, um, to um, Gladstone specifically GIVI, because it was simply the best institute in the world to do HIV research in. And this was really thanks to Warner, in his mustache day still at the time, um, who had put together and really an incredible, incredible group of, of, of scientists devoted to a, exclusively to HIV research at the beginning and then more and more other viruses afterwards. So when I started there, we worked very much on the TUT protein. We were already interested in when the virus is active and the virus is inactive here, or latent. Um, and we focused very much on this transcriptional machinery that renders the virus active or inactive, especially the tiny little TUT protein that is the transactivator encoded by the virus itself. We did a lot of research in one specific post-translational modification, which is acetylation. At that time, it was something that was uniquely reserved for histone proteins. Um, but we showed that it actually applies also to non-histone proteins, and especially also viral non-histone proteins, which is the TUT protein. So we showed over the years while working at GIVI that um, the TUT is actually modified at many uh, different residues. It is a histone-like protein in many ways, and uh, these histone mimics have recently gained a lot of at attention in the virology field because they seem to meaningfully compete with real histones um, in, in, in transcriptional regulation. So TUT is a real bona fide histone mimic because it gets modified by all the enzymes that are modifying um, real histones. Um, we found specifically that the TUT protein was interacting with uh, specific proteins that had modules, that rec uh, do protein domains that recognize acetylated lysines. Um, first, um, the PICA um, um, factor, which is a histone acetyltransferase, but it has this little domain, which is called a bromo domain, that binds specifically to this um, acetylated lysine, and we showed that this was important for keeping the virus active versus rendering it latent. But we did not stop at HIV, at, at HIV and TUT. We really went around the whole machinery that TUT is recruiting from the host to regulate transcription. We showed that the, poly, that the RNA polymerase that the virus hijacks for its own replication also becomes acetylated. We did this with colleagues here in the room and, and, and at Gladstone. And we also showed that a factor that is recruited by TAT and is really very important, the super elongation complex, is also acetylated. Um, and have worked on um, the specific acetyl sites and have also shown that this again is a specific interface that the, that, uh, the protein is offering to another protein that has the domain, the bromo domain um, that then specifically interacts here, and in this case it was the BRD4 um, factor. 
And I would be standing here and telling you exactly the next modification that we have identified in TAT or in any of these pro uh, proteins, if in 2020 not uh, the, another pandemic uh, uh, had hit, which was of course SARS-CoV-2, um, which some have called simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. This was according to Sir Peter Medawar in 1977. And we, this uh, 2020 was just a time of transition um, where I um, started to take over positions at uh, or directorship of the, um, of the uh, Gladstone Institute of Virology. Um, Warner was still present, um, helping with this transition. And I wanted to highlight sort of a few highlights of, uh, of this time, especially the early time. The first thing that we did in response was to build a BSL-3 laboratory, and all Gladstone was really critical for this. Um, we reactivated an existing BSL-3 facility on the sixth floor in record time um, and turned it into a functioning viral laboratory where we could study the virus and, and meaningful contribute to, to, to its solution. Warner also stepped up in many ways, and Monica has mentioned it, um, that he did a lot of the press uh, work um, at the time. We both did a lot of webinars together. We um, helped guide the response in the institute here within, the, within a larger group, the task force. We did a lot of um, public education, but Warner really at that time took the brunt off my shoulders and the way that he really um, became the public voice of, um, of, of uh, the Virology Institute and took a lot of these um, the press um, uh, assignments um, that, we, um, that we had every day and that ranged from the New York Times to ABC News to the San Francisco Chronicle. So thank you, Warner. I think we also decided that we could meaningful contribute to the um, um, meaningfully contribute to the to solving the the, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, based on some very unique strengths that Gladstone has. One of them is stem cell research. With um, the be having Shinya Yamanaka on our faculty, there's a very strong stem cell biology research here at Gladstone, and that has led or helped us to develop a lot of these organoids models mimicking. Um, different organ system in the dish that we could use in the BSL-3 laboratory to infect and to study um, what was going on. And that led to many, many collaborations, again, here with people at Gladstone or at UCSF or nationwide. Warner and, well, Monica and I have the same taste in, in nice pictures. We uh, chose the same picture from one of Warner's uh, publications. Uh, but Warner had a, a long-lasting interest in, in, in HIV infection of the brain and had invested already in his lab in, in brain organoids, which are particularly complex and difficult to grow, and used those um, to really show um, or, or sort of help unravel part of the questions um, that are surrounding um, the involvement of SARS-CoV-2 and the influence of SARS-CoV-2 on, on brain function by showing that it uniquely infects the astrocytes in, in brains um, and, um, and, and showing some of the, um, the, um, the consequences of this infection. Another strength that we have at Gladstone is the CRISPR technology with uh, Jennifer Doudna as part of our faculty. Um, and very early in the, in the pandemic, um, based on an existing program that actually Parinas here in the audi audience has originated in HIV, we came together and pivoted that program from HIV into SARS-CoV-2 using CRISPR as a diagnostic. And here we took advantage of a specific CRISPR enzyme, Cas13A, that can directly detect viral RNA or any RNA and, and turned it into a sensitive and specific diagnostic that could be detected uh, simply with a mobile phone. Jennifer. Jennifer's presence here in the Institute was also very instrumental in building up other subgenomic tools of the virus, specifically virus-like particles, where we reduce the, the, the full-length virus just down to four structural proteins, 
um, and, 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 and produce authentic viral particles that are composed of these four structural proteins. And that um, has a lot of advantages. A, we don't have to go into the BSL-3 because it's not a non-infectious system, but B, because we have all of the four um, structural proteins and not just the spike protein, we can actually test mutations and, um, and evolution of variants in these structural proteins um, in a very high throughput and, um, and, and um, non-dangerous way. But what about acetylation? I told you that this was the passion for me for 15 years. Have we completely abandoned this? Um, the answer is no, and I want to just share at the end uh, one, one small snippet of, um, of, of data with you um, that actually reconnects back to the, to the beginning. Um, and that came from um, multiple collaborations that we had with, um, with uh, colleagues here at UCSF, Nevin Krogan and Andreas Pushnik at the Biohub about doing systems biology approaches to SARS-CoV-2 relatively rapidly. On the right, you see a protein-protein interaction map that was published in April 2020, sort of in record time after, um, after the, virus was, uh, or the virus sequence was, um, was known. Um, on, on the right, there was um, a, a CRISPR screen a genome-wide CRISPR screen that we did with Andreas um, and that identified novel pathways and here the cholesterol pathway, for example, that is important in, 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 viral, in, in the viral life cycle. So one of, this, one of my students in the lab, Irene Chen, um, picked up on uh, one unique interaction that was found in the interactome by, um, by, Nevin, by, by, by the Krogan lab. And this was with the E protein, which is one of the four structural proteins that are in the virus-like particles or in the virus, as I told you at the beginning, that had interactions with proteins like BRD2 and BRD4, which are proteins that have bromodomains shown in the in blue here, BD1 and BD2, two bromodomains, and, and, and form a very um, interesting uh, class of uh, transcriptional activators. And I chose this project not only because um, it is an acetylation-related project, but also because Irene is actually, um, I, I, Warner is in Irene's thesis committee, and he has so far not relinquished this role, but it will continue to, um, to actually accompany her until her graduation graduation, which uh, speaks for Warner's dedication to training. Um, and this is a collaboration with the Fujimori lab, and James Longbotham did part of the, part of the studies. But what, uh, what uh, Irene showed is that, indeed, the, you know, the interaction with these bromodomain proteins in, indicated that it might be acetylated, because the acetyl uh, group is basically the, the intera interaction phase for, for, the, for, the, for the bromodomain proteins. And indeed, after a lot of um, optimization, Irene and Khalid in the, in the lab could show that, um, that the E protein is acetylated, especially when you treat the cells with inhibitors of deacetylases. Um, and this is very unique to two lysine residues, K53 and K63, um, because if you mutate those, you don't see the acetylation. Um, and these acetyl groups indeed interact with bromodomains from BRD4, in this case, the second bromodomain of BRD4, because in these NMR titration experiments that uh, James performed, you could see that if you add to the purified uh, bromodomain of BRD4 a, a, a um, peptide that carries an acetylated K53, you see perturbation, which is indicative of binding, the same as, as true for K60, uh, for the for the K63 acetyl group, but it's not true for the unacetylated peptide. And it's also not true when you mix these acetylated uh, peptides with the uh, uh, first bromodomain of BRD4. So really indicating that there's a unique interaction with the second bromodomain. And to cut a long story short, um, what Irene proposed in her paper was that um, the acetylated E protein is a specific interaction uh, 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 interface for the second bromodomain of BRD4, and that recruits BRD4 away from its normal function uh, in gene regulation, and specifically in regulating antiviral genes. Um, a lot of the interferons are regulated by BRD4, and that when you block this um, immune response, you increase viral infection, and so that is a, um, a, a benefit, basically, for the virus. 
But I told you that the E protein is not only just any protein, it's actually a very specific protein that is part of the virus, of the virus, um, of, the, of, of the virion itself. Um, and so we went back to the technology, the VLP technology that um, Jennifer and Sayed in, in her lab uh, specifically invented and asked what is the acetylation doing for the virus and for the virus uh, formation and the particle formation. And you can see here that when you look at the wild type, um, these particles um, um, elicit a certain reaction when you put them to, the, to a target cell. Uh, but when you use the... Um, the, the mutated uh, E protein, when you just in, incorporate an E protein that has a, a two single or a single or two mutations in these two lysines that are normally acetylated, you can see that actually the infection is enhanced. And when you introduce an, a mutation that actually mimics the acetylation, this is completely suppressed, really indicating that the acetylation is really not very good for the viral particle production. And that is also shown here when you look actually at the components of these viral like particles, you can see that when you have the double lysine mutant, you have actually much more E in the particle, and you have also much more of the RNA incorporated. But if you have the Q mutant, there's absolutely nothing. And this was reproduced with, um, with uh, full molecular clones of the virus, where we could also show that mutation of these acetyl sites, really tiny little mutations in the virus, uh, make the virus uh, perform better. And so the, the full picture of this is that the acetylation, what we believe is actually a host response. Um, the host is responding to the invasion of the virus by acetylating the E protein to decrease the viral particle production. The virus has returned and has sort of responded to this, um, to this inactivation by, um, by making use of these acetyl groups on the E protein, um, recruiting the bad proteins away from uh, antiviral genes and actually balancing the virus infection back up um, in this arms race that we are very used to between um, ho the host and the virus. So to end, I think what we can say about SARS-CoV-2, that it is a piece of bad news wrapped in protein, but that protein does not like to be acetylated when it's on the surface. So we continue on these studies, both on HIV um, and on SARS. We have been blessed uh, with um, many, many collaborators. Um, Warner, I have mentioned, uh, but many others who are here in the room. Um, my lab, um, who is um, really awesome, and has been actually enlarged by two newcomers from Warner's lab, who we are very happy to welcome. Um, and we are glad, Warner, that we continue in collaborating with you in your new role um, and contributing, hopefully, some meaningful data for the, for the product that you're developing. So with this, I end, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.